starting just a little bit longer. We're having a little bit of technical issues right now, but no worries. It's going to be good. You guys are good. Everything's good. We're awesome. Starting a little bit. Oh, my uh, friend volunteers for them, and she told me about how it's an um, organization that um, facilitates workshops in prisons that um, teach uh, prisoners uh, mindfulness and nonviolent communication, which helps them while they're in the prisons and also helps them once they're out of the prisons and also reduces violence in the prisons. So my friend who volunteers uh, recommended me to Brian, um, the leader of the group, um, as somebody to be part of the Racial Equity Committee, um, because racial equity has always been an interest of mine. I studied social work um, at... Uh, the Evergreen State College and I'm a social worker now um, and it's just always been um, something that I've felt passionate about so I always was interested in like being in a helping profession um, but uh, just generally like I like started um, doing some internships at social service agencies in, um, in Olympia and I just grew to be really passionate about it. Mm, okay I'm Janice Ng and I actually am one of one of the founding members of Freedom Project um, ever since 1998 and I started studying nonviolent communication, and uh, we had gone with the founder of the work into the prison, and um, some of the inmates there said, you know, you can't just give us a lecture, we need to practice this, and uh, so we formed groups to uh, go in, and out of that came the Freedom Project. So, um, how do we get here today to this project? Well, when you look, at the factors of mass incarceration and who's in prison. And um, when we look at incarceration rates, that uh, we see that their race has everything to, to do with it, and that, um, or a major part of it. And so we are looking at the systemic structures that uh, affect mass incarceration, um, education, health care, wealth distribution. And so Freedom Project has made a commitment not only in our own organization to uh, be racially equitable and uh, so social justice oriented, of course, um, but to how do we do that in the community? And um, uh, so this project was born out of that. One thing that we have been looking at is already uh, is just how it affects ourselves, looking at our own race um, interpersonally, how are we affected by race. And this, what today what we're hoping to get is uh, to look at what has been happening systemically that may be unconscious and how has that affected the organizations um, here in the U District or wherever people are from, but mostly focusing on the U District. And um, uh, so how has that affected the development of it? And then how can we, you know, later we'll look at how can we affect change.
hosted by the Freedom Project, and one of the things that we, we practice is mindfulness. So beginning this event, I would like to invite you to a moment of mindfulness with me. I'm going to bring this um, Tibetan singing bowl and um, guide you through a, a quick meditation. So as the resonation, as the resonation of the bell subsides, subsides, bring your awareness and your consciousness to your breathing. And breathe deeply into your stomach, pulling down your diaphragm, filling your belly and your oxygen and your lungs and your chest with oxygen. The life force that keeps us moving. Feel the air as it comes in through your nose, travels into your throat, into your lungs, into your belly. Feel as you open and expand. If you're having any thoughts, feeling any sensations, any emotions, that's okay. Just bring your consciousness back to your breath when you realize these things. bell again. I invite you to open your eyes and bring your awareness back into this room. With intention. Intention to be honest and open and allow your space, yourself the space to be vulnerable and be you. So without further ado, I'd like to bring up Crystal Coop, who is the manager of U District Street Medicine. Okay, 
good afternoon. Everybody can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, so a little bit about me. Well, this comes up. Oh, this comes up. So my name is Crystal Koo. Um, I am a recent UW graduate. I just got my MSW. Uh, and the director of a project called University District Street Medicine, something that I founded two years ago while in grad school. Um, some personal stuff. I am a member of the Macaw Indian Nation, and I am formerly homeless, so this is kind of my, my jam. This is my area. So I'm going to talk very quickly, and um, I'm going to be trying to be mindful of time and also mindful to not sound like an auctioneer. So I'm going to talk about um, disparities in oppression in healthcare, uh, kind of historical, and then on the provision side, on the professional side. And then uh, a little bit about what U District Street Medicine does and some other, and I'll kind of weave in different ways to get involved because one of the reasons you all are here is to see how you can get involved, right? Okay, oh, we're in the right place. So I just push the little arrows, right? Maybe. Now what do I do? <laughs> Tech major, I was not. There we go. Okay. So, some historical oppression in healthcare. So, we all know kind of the traditional healthcare model of go to the doctor and then there's hospital and all that kind of stuff. Um, there is also a big research side of healthcare, as we know, being in Seattle. You probably know that very well. Um, and this is where a lot of the distrust and issues and oppressive qualities really started and remain is in research. Um, there are research requirements now, um, and a lot of it is because of these different things um, that, you know, like do no harm and informed consent, things like that. All of that came out of things like the Tuskegee experiment, sterilization of Native women, Nazi concentration camps, camps in the 1980s, AIDS epidemic. So the Tuskegee experiment, for those that you don't know, is for, for 40 years, uh, African American men were either injected with syphilis or they already had it and they weren't told that they had it or got injected. And then they lived a very slow, disease-ridden, painful life for the next 40 years and were not given medical treatment or even told that they had a curable disease. So this was huge violations, I mean human rights violations number one, but this was huge violation of informed consent and do no harm, right? That's exactly what they did. So. That's a good reason why the African American community doesn't necessarily trust um, healthcare, medical services, right? I used to work in county jails, and the public, the nurses that worked there, I mean, this was in the early 2000s, and uh, this experiment went from the 40s to the 70s. In the early 2000s, we still had African American men in prison going, Are you going to inject me with something? <laughs> so, this is a really rooted thing, and understandably so. Uh, sterilization of Native women, this is another one that you think of that and you go, okay, this probably happened during colonial times when all that other stuff happened, right? Smallpox, Trail of Tears, so on and so forth. No, this was the 70s. And what happened then is they would sterilize women through tubal ligation and, and not give them a choice and say, uh, you know, you're on federal aid, you're on public aid, we will cut off your aid if we don't sterilize you. 1970s. Nazi concentration camps, I think we're very familiar with a lot of the experiments and things that happened there. And again, the distrust among the uh, Jewish population with, with medical. 1980s AIDS epidemic, uh, you know, you get AIDS from a drinking glass. It was a gay disease. It was an IV drug user disease, that kind of thing. And that stigma still remains. Um, and actually beyond AIDS. Uh, a lot of STDs and things like that. So oppression in healthcare provision. So there's the provision of healthcare and then there's the practice of healthcare. And sadly, there's oppression in both. Um, access to healthcare, I think we're all sort of familiar with uh, how much easier it is to navigate and access healthcare when you have health insurance. Um, and then your ease of navigation and access improves on the type of insurance that you have. Um, somebody who's got a PPO is going to look different, a lot different than somebody who's on AppleCare or um, uh, Medicaid. Uh, so again, medical insurance. Trans health. So trans health is a very, very complicated one because 
some of these others you can kind of say, oh, okay, well, these are the roots of this and that, and you know, they're working on it, and this is something, you know. Trans health, I can't, they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> they don't know what to ask, or they don't want to ask it, right? Um, pronouns and things, I mean, the doctors are still taking a lot of issue with this and not really understanding. A good person to know in the community that's working on trans health, or two good people to know that are working on trans health, is Mark Eich and Josh Lowe, both at Neighbor Care Clinics. I think Mark is down at Pike Place Market, and Josh Lowe is uh, the outreach manager at 45th Street Homeless Youth Clinic. Josh is trans, and Josh has been a huge pioneer in, in uh, working with um, not just Neighbor Care, but on the federal level of changing how trans health is um, is done. And the reason he started doing that is because as a as someone who identifies as trans, he has had horrible experiences. <laughs> so he turned around and said, let's fix this. And what and that's that's the uh, consensus that I get from him and some other folks working on this is people just don't know what they're doing. And a lot of people just don't want to listen. Women's health, this is very common. I mean I think this is something that's that most people know about, birth control, abortion, so on and so forth. These are not new things. Uh, frequent flyers and substance use, like those kind of go hand in hand in some ways. And this is sort of my wheelhouse in a way. Um, frequent flyers is a tag, or, or frequent flyers are red flags, tags that people will get in um, doctor's offices or mostly emergency room. So your frequent flyers, quote unquote, are those that um, have untreated or undiagnosed mental health issues and or have uh, heavy substance abuse issues, alcohol, IV drugs, um, you name it. And those folks end up utilizing uh, ER services, usually as their primary care provider, for a lot of different reasons. Back to the earlier stuff, access to health care, medical insurance, some other, you know, any other sort of things in their makeup that might cause them to have problems. Um, mental health and substance use it's not a what came first, chicken or the egg, but sometimes they are together. And what has been shown over and over and over again is that those that are heavy substance users, especially IV, um, have very big history of trauma. Childhood trauma, historical trauma, all different kinds of things. A lot of them are homeless. The trauma of homelessness is a thing, right? And it's a thing that's not really being identified. Um, historical trauma is just now being identified. So we got a long ways to go where, before the general population realizes that homelessness is also a trauma and not a crime, right? So you get your frequent flyers that are either coming in because they're ODing or they're having you know, some sort of reaction to drugs or a mix of drugs or people that are exhibiting mental health symptoms that have either gone undiagnosed or untreated. There's oppression in that and there's discrimination in that because um, they're just now seen as a drug addict or now seen as uh, somebody who's crazy or something like that. So the level of care drops down, the quality of care drops down. Uh, an example of that is a guy who's been out here, he's been chronically homeless for probably 20 years now out here. And he got hit in the back of the head a few weeks ago by somebody while he was sleeping in the park. I don't know who hit him. He doesn't either. He was asleep. So he went to the ER and he got staples put in his head. He's a heavy up. He's a heavy drinker. He's an alcoholic. Partially because he's got a serious history of childhood trauma and partially because he's been homeless for 20 years. I, I don't have a hard time connecting those things, <laughs> right? Um, and then let's not forget the traumatic brain injury that he probably just endured, endured by getting a whack of you in the park, right? So he's got staples on his head, and I see him a few weeks later, and he's inebriated, and he's talking about how he's got to get these staples out of his head because they really hurt. That's fair. So call the ambulance. Ambulance comes. Takes 45 minutes for the ambulance to come. I call it twice. And then they get there, and they put both the EMTs just kind of look and go, "Oh yeah, I know this guy. I've seen this guy before." And they go, "Uh oh." So they take him in, they take his staples out, so on and so forth. I talked to a friend of mine, and I said, hey, did you see so-and-so? Next time you see him, check in and see how he's doing, because he went to the hospital today. You know, we do that in the neighborhood. We kind of tag team and check on people. Um, 
And that person said, matter of fact, I saw him this afternoon. It was the same afternoon. And he was slumped over in the bus, bus stop, still drunk, with a big bandage on his head. So that was a revolving door. That's what happened there, okay? And I, well, it won't say on his chart, I firmly believe that it was because he was a frequent flyer, okay? So that's like a real-time last week example of oppression in healthcare and one of my current rants. Uh, so oppression in the healthcare profession. This will feed that last slide, right? Like the profession will feed the provision, all right? And there's a few reasons for that. There's many reasons for that, but I'm really gonna touch on a few. Um, the hierarchical structure of medicine. So I am a social worker who works for University of Washington Department of Medicine, okay? There are six health science schools in um, the University of Washington system, okay? There's medicine, there's social work, nursing, physical therapy, pharmacy, public health, and dentistry. Medicine is kind of the, the top dog, right? They have a lot of resources, they have a lot of space, they have a lot of people, they have a lot of money. Um, and then it kind of goes down from there. And that's just on the academic side. Then there's the profession side, like in the hospitals and in the clinics and things like that. It's basically the same hierarchical structure transferred over into professional. So academic and professional, not much changes there. Um, is every team like that? Is every doctor a jerk? Is every social worker treated like garbage? No, absolutely not. Um, there are some that are wonderful. But that is kind of the structure and sort of the norm that a lot of people say. Like nurses will tell each other, hey, the doctor, the, reside, the attending docs are going to be jerks. Or we don't really know what social work does here. They're just here. You know, there's, there is that. And, you know, there's a lot of movement making, you know, working towards changing that. But we've got a long ways to go. <laughs> um, the cost of education. Because of the cost of education, there are many, many brilliant folks that are not becoming nurses and not becoming doctors and not becoming social workers. And many, many of those folks, a disproportionate number of those folks are folks of color and women. And it's because of the cost of education. I was a case manager for 10 years and I worked with young adults for a long time and saw some of the best and brightest folks um, in these different transitional housing programs and things like that. And I'm a big school nerd and I always push school. I gotta go to school. Education, gotta do it. Higher education, big deal, right? And they all wanted to do it, and they all would thrive and do so wonderful there, but they go, I don't, those loans, I don't know, I can't do it. Like, when you have that poverty mindset, because you've lived in poverty, and the idea of debt, especially hundreds of thousands of dollars, I didn't go back. I mean, I didn't go back for grad school until I was 30 years old because I avoided loans. And then I was like, huh, I'm getting into more debt working for a crap wage than I am accruing loans. I guess I better go back, right? That was my final thing. So the, the fear of debt is really real for somebody who ha doesn't have a lot, right? If somebody comes from a family of doctors and you know, it's kind of set, like, oh, it's sort of scary to take loans, oh dear, okay, but they, they've always had a safety net and they, always, and they will. And they also can see, they can see the long game a little further on like, well, I, it will eventually pay itself off when I get this job and things like that. But if that's not your worldview, if that's not your experience, that's a huge leap of faith to do that, right? That's a huge leap of faith to think that this is gonna pay off in eight years. Eight years is a long time to wait. Lay gratification, well, not everybody can hang with that and understand it so. So that leads to access to opportunities. Um, a lot of folks that are med students and nursing students and, and the like um, come from families of doctors and come from folks, or not necessarily families of doctors, but folks that have, you know, that have uh, many family members that have gone to higher education. You don't see a lot of first-generation college students in medicine. You don't see a lot of first-generation college students in nursing and other professions like that. Even in social work, you don't see many, right? So there's a reason for that. And the reason is schools are targeting and professions are targeting certain sectors, right? You kind of got to know and already be in it to know that this is an opportunity. So fortunately, um, University of Washington does do some pretty neat stuff around that. Um, 
They have, they have programs that work with uh, American Indian and Alaska Native folks to get into med school and uh, other health sciences. They have summer bridge programs where they take uh, what are they, uh, college sophomores in, the, in their undergrad and have them come and you know, check out med school and dental school. It's a summer, summer medical dental education program. Um, so there are some bridges that are being built to sort of right some of these wrongs, but we've got a long ways to go. Right. Um, some other on the ground stuff on the provision of healthcare is University District Street Medicine, so that would be me. So what we do is we address health disparities within the homeless population in the U District and fill gaps in current service provision. So one of the ways, and I'm going to simplify this a little more than it actually was. I mean, our formula was simple. The execution was not. <laughs> um, I love you, Doug, but you know. Uh, so when we started this project, we said, what is working, what is not, what is missing, what is there? And before we even answer all these questions, let's ask the people that live here, what's working, what doesn't, what's here, what's not, right? What makes the most sense? What is difficult? All that different kind of stuff. Let's ask the people instead of going, this is what I think you need. This is what we think you need as a big institution, right? So our formula was very simple. Ask, get answers, collaborate with the community, and do. That's what it was. <laughs> that's what it was. There were many more moving parts with that once we got UW involved, but that is still the basic formula and remains to this day. And it's been invaluable. Um, I mean, we found out through working with the community that there is a lot more than just uh, homeless youth and young adults here. We have a much older crowd. We also have a lot of veterans here. We have a lot of women, and we have a lot of older women that are wondering where they get respite care for hysterectomies. It's not just birth control, right? It's not just youngsters and teen pregnancy and things like that. And we would not have gotten that information if we didn't ask. And then we started working on solutions, and the solutions were, what do you think works? Or what have you seen so far that doesn't work? And they answered, so we don't do that. <laughs> right? We don't do that. It really is that simple. And through that, we've been able to employ current formerly homeless folks. We've been able to uh, create partnerships with other agencies in the area and kind of have this group of, of support and love from the district, kind of for the district. Um, we train UW Health Science students, so we work with all the health science schools that I prattled off a minute ago. Um, and our core thing that we teach, I mean, we do basic things like uh, blood pressure readings and resource referral and navigation and things like that, right? Like practical services of linking people up with housing and so on and so forth. Um, but our foundational piece that we have is to learn how to listen and the art of conversation and how to build relationships and actual genuine relationships. We go out and we do street outreach and we do community-based outreach at two partner sites. And, uh, and we say in, there, in the first couple of times you go out, don't have an agenda-driven conversation. Talk about the weather. Talk about the Seahawks, which happened today, right? Blue team meets purple team, something like that? Okay, all right, cool. Um, you know, talk about these different things, right? And, and have that conversation and get to know somebody, remember names, things like that. Do that before you try to provide care, right? Because if somebody came up to me on the sidewalk or in a coffee shop and started getting in my business about my medical and social service needs, I would tell them to get away from me. And I would call security, right? <laughs> None of your business. <laughs> but if this is somebody that I see at the coffee shop all the time and we've shot the breeze here and there and had a cup of coffee and then they saw that I was limping one day and asked me about it, I'd be a little more inclined to talk about it, right? That's how simple and important that relationship is. So that's what we front load because unfortunately curriculum at um, the health science level doesn't do a lot of relationship building. So that's a gap we fill. Uh, and then we collaborate with current formerly homeless individuals to, to design accountable service. Um, again, we are not doing this for warm fuzzies. We are not doing this to 
sort of toot our own horn and fluff our own feathers. We're doing this because this, these are needs that we saw in the neighborhood, needs that we heard in the neighborhood. And then we said, I hear you. Right? And we did. So there are ways to get involved in that. I'll leave some cards somewhere around here. Um, some other great places to check out for this kind of stuff. Um, if you're into advocacy, um, the, this is a long one, P Physicians for a National Health Plan of the Pacific Northwest. It's like PNPHWWPP, something like that. Um, they're great. You don't have to be a physician. Matter of fact, you don't have to be a health science person at all. You're just an advocate saying, you know, we want more equitable health care um, in the realm of insurance. There's also um, the U District Conversation on Homelessness. That is a monthly meeting that really focuses on uh, issues surrounding the U and, and homelessness within the U. We have folks like Rudy that's working on Hulu and other projects in the neighborhood um, from state advocacy, federal advocacy, all the way down to, to local stuff um, here in the U. If you have any questions for me or want to get involved, like I say, I'll leave some cards. Uh, I think I've taken way too much time. But I will take any questions, if that's OK. Yeah, OK. Any questions? I know that was a lot of No? That's it? All right, we want to get to the film. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much, and uh, have a wonderful rest of your day. Does anybody know what a troop laps and a Ric Flair is? No? Come stand up, please. Please stand up. Stand up. Two claps and a Ric Flair. If you ever watched Ric Flair, this guy was so energetic. He'd come on and like he would churn a whole auditorium of people, bring their energy up real fast. Real fast. He'd get in the wrestling ring. He was a wrestler, old school wrestler, and he'd be like, <laughs> Right? So that's two claps and a Ric Flair. All right, so on the count of three, let's do a two claps and a Ric Flair. Ready? Count with me. One, two, three. <laughs> One more time. One, two, three. All right, thank you guys. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna bring up uh, Janice Ng. She's gonna be the uh, facility, di or excuse me, dialogue facilitator. One of them. Uh, yeah. One of them. And I. So um, thank you, Crystal, for really bringing it real and bringing it home, and how systemic racism has actually affected the university district and. Um, this film is uh, about how systemic racism has affected four areas, and one is on uh, wealth distribution, um, criminal justice, education, and healthcare. And uh, so, um, and what we're going to be doing afterwards, where is Queen and Liz? Um, we're going to be breaking up into groups, and um, three groups, and discuss how uh, systemic racism has affected your organization, if, according to um, one of those focuses. And so, um, and so be thinking about your organization that you are working with or um, the area that you've um, been living in. And um, so enjoy the film. It's called uh, Colorblind um, Rethinking Race. Um, yeah, there's, there's no shortage of conversations that deal with racism. And um, personally, like, I hear, well, talking about racism is just perpetuating racism. And like, I think about that and I'm like, hold on, so if I went to the doctor and he came and he's like, I'm sorry sir, your, your test results came up positive, you have like six months to live. And I was like, well, what are we going to do about this? And he was like, well, we'll just ignore it and it's going to get better. Like, that's kind of like the ideology behind that in my, in my lens. Um, and then, like, another thing that really gets on my nerves is, like, I do yoga. And so people are like, I don't see color. Like, what, what's racism? Like, what is this? I don't, we're all human race. That's the only race that there is. And then, like, they eat, like, an organic granola bar and, like, do a yoga pose. And I'm like, dude. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so... Let's watch this movie and have some good conversation. And um, I, I really like it. It's really insightful. So I'm going to start this now. 
and try to get it darker in here. Keep it on my projects and then also try to serve like the people that grow around the sustainable part of it about creating my own business. So I'm not very but you know, like you were talking about having money to do business or whatever. I'm super cash free because I have great ideas and it would be profitable, but I also have these bills that I can have to pay. So like, I have these really small, not, not the best way to job, so I'm trying to maintain the flow. To maintain, to maintain like, just my low level sustainability. But it's when I can't put it in the energy market. Um, and so they were like children. Um, the work schools over 50,000. Thank you so much, Julie. Awesome. Bring it back. Which is so great. I can't believe it. Hi, y'all. Hi. 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 Hi.
Tem que ser trilado a ação, é assim que eu tenho. Tem que ser trilado a ação. Eles estão pequenos. Essa é a única. Essa é a única que eu tenho. Essa é a única que eu tenho. E eles servem mostly people of color. So does having access to food banks necessarily make an area not a food desert? Food banks are meant to be like emergency. Yeah, so provide some kind of safety net, but... No, because here is not a food desert. I, I wasn't talking about yeah, yeah, yeah. specifically. Yeah, yeah. 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 
communication and training programs for them. And we, need, we talked about circles and how circles can uh, bring about much more uh, communication that is not hierarchy based. Um, we talked about and that that need for honest communication, honest connection, and the students need to be given an opportunity. And the restorative circles were we talked about uh, because they give that students the the position and the ability, the time to see what's really happening in life. And usually they're not even given that opportunity. So, um, we talked about uh, yeah for kids as well as, as adults the restorative circles are would be a wonderful way. Um, and the fact that there's no judgment in the historic circles and learning that aspect. Um, the, the administration needed to change. I mean, the, the things that are happening because the administration is the power. And we need a new way to do that. We talked about seeing our implicit basis or bias and um, the need for people um, being aware of their bias. Let's see. What else was it? Oh, covered well. Good job. Way to go. Uh, my group, we talked about wealth, and uh, we had time to ask two questions. The first one was, what is our individual relationship with wealth? And um, we had a wide range. Uh, we had on one end somebody that had money that they didn't even know what to do with, and then on another end, someone that came from poverty, and also somebody that uh, their house was foreclosed and they needed to go live with their grandma, and um, thank God she was a homeowner. Um, the second question was, what came alive when the child that was bullied in school decided he would break the rules to stay away from being, um, from being victimized? And, goodness, um, I'm drawing a blank here right now. Uh, Just 30 more seconds and we're going to go. Yeah, would somebody <laughs> oh, else? Oh, not have we talked a little, I talked a little bit about having a teenage son and having his opportunities to uh, try again and again to succeed at school um, that I worried about potentially that being related to the fact that he's white. Thank you. And the health, where's the health group here? Um, so we talked about a lot of different things. I mean, health is such a broad subject matter, but uh, what we ended up kind of talking about at the end, which um, was interesting, um, was uh, just the, how racism is so systemic in, in the health system and in public health. And um, it goes down, you know, to just like access, but also in the way that the providers are taught in school as seeing, um, uh, you know, POC as like, or people of color as like a separate vulnerable group rather than their care being integrated into uh, the learning. And so in that way, like white people and white care for white folks becomes like the sort of the norm and then care for other groups is other groups. And so how that really trickles down and affects um, the way that doctors are interacting with people or other um, providers interact with folks can't give them the what they might need. Um, and that was also reflected in uh, um, sharing about the food bank and how the food bank um, can give food to folks, but if it's not even in like if it's not even used in the in their cuisine, the cuisine that they use at home, then how is that really helping? So um, those are just some of the Thank you, all the group. Um, we have these feedback forms, which are essential for us to keep, 
for our funding and um, do you want to come to improve but also to helps us to give feedback you know um, uh, for what's happening here how we, um, and also to um, it, it helps us to get our funding as well so, so. thank you we'd, we'd appreciate it if everybody could fill out this form Too, but I always forget pens. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I do, please. Jen, do you have a pen? Thank you very much. Oh, no, I need a pen. Okay. okay. All right. Do you have a pen?
you want to be on that list, find me. Um, and the last thing is that it's very important for us to get your home addresses. Um, the city of Seattle wants to make sure that the funding is going to residents of Seattle. So um, if you haven't given us that information, if you could find me, please, and give that to me, I'd appreciate it. Yes? If we gave you the home address last month? Then I have it. Okay, so we say that. Um, on your way out, we have a box yes. on the table outside. If you'll please drop off your feedback forms over there, we really appreciate it. And we also have an announcement from Ginger. Oh, yes, and you can rip the forms in half so you can leave a part. Um, you can take a part of it with you. Well, the, or... the volunteer portion can go back to The volunteer portion can go back to Susie. That's the bottom portion. Actually, what I have is two invitations for events at University Congregational UC, University, UC, well, it's the University Congregational United Church of Christ, which is the one up on the corner of 16th and 45th. Uh, next month, or well, this month, the fourth Wednesday of this and every month, we have a conversation, we have a series of conversations that we call Kingian Conversations because they're based on the ideas of Martin Luther King. Usually we start with a reading of some sort. I think this time we might do a Ta-Nehisi Coates reading. It's, it's just relevant readings. And we have as diverse a group of people as we can get together. And the, the, the number of people has ranged from, I think, 10 to about 50. So, you know, it, it's very variable. And the conversations have been really good, and we would be we are, you are very much invited to that. I will try to get the, that information out on the list, the list that, that these guys have, all of our email lists. So that's invitation number one. Invitation number two, I actually have a brochure for, a flyer for if you're interested. Uh, our introductory workshop on Kingian nonviolence. This is actually part of a much more formal structure. These are workshops that have been done in quite a number of places around the country. It's a two-day workshop, uh, very much structured to helping communities develop the concept of how to work things out non-violently um, in the ways very much following Martin Luther King's ideas, which he got from Gandhi. I mean, it's, this is not his invention, but it's his, his modifications and his community's modifications. Uh, that one actually has a registration fee though uh, it's free for students and also anybody that would have trouble with the registration fee is you have only to ask. It, it's reduced. So I have flyers for that. I'll put them on the table outside the door. These black ones there. <laughs> I think that's it. And if you have questions, you can always ask me. Thank you all for letting me know. Thank you. And, and the very last thing, um, we'd like to take a group photo. If you would like to not be in the photo, um, please be on this side of the room. Um, but for the group photo, we'd like to take over here. Hi, I'm Susie Bernard Halberstadt. I am the community organizer with the U District Racial Equity Project. Um, I moved from Spokane, Washington in uh, a few months ago and have been looking to get involved um, with social justice causes in uh, Seattle, and so I applied for the job when I found it. I grew up in California, um, which in the Bay Area, and it was a diverse area, and um, have always um, <coughs> felt a kinship for um, campaigns and issues of um, race and equality. Um, and this just seemed to fit really well with, um, with my life. I think today went great. Um, I think it was really well attended. Um, it was a good group. My name is Brian Chang. I first started as a practicum student when I was going for my MSW at the University of Washington and I was looking for an organization that 
did work with nonviolent communication, and Freedom Project was the main one that did it. And when I graduated, um, I was fortunate enough to be offered a position for Director of Community and Organizational Development. And we applied for a grant and got it, and so we're here doing the University District Racial Equity Project as one of the community outreach efforts at Freedom Project. So they're two separate entities. It is a community organizing project that is, the main goal is to build neighborhood by getting, by building relationships and by getting the voices of residents and other stakeholders in the university district to come together to learn about systemic oppression and how, how that impacts their neighborhood. And this project has four phases. The first is collective learning, and so we're doing that through watching documentaries and having dialogue. And the second phase will be research and analysis. We'll be forming a community advisory board that will get together and, and decide you know, how they want to build a survey or find out what's going on in their neighborhood. <clears throat> the third phase is direct action. So whatever issue that they isolate as the one that they want to be working on, the U District community members will decide then um, what are the strategies that they want to try to effectively change this issue. And then we'll provide training for them to do so. And then the last phase is celebration. So that's community getting together and acknowledging, hey, there's power in people coming together and getting their voices heard, especially the people most impacted by systemic oppression. Well, the first reason is just very practical. Um, Freedom Project is located in the U District, and so as an effort to build relationship with the neighborhood that it's in, um, this project was an idea um, that will kind of be the first step in creating that relationship. And secondly, the University District <coughs> recently also has had an influx of um, various disparities um, that are that is being stimulated because of problematic policies that the city um, and different institutions and businesses have been implementing. Um, resulting in things like increased drug trafficking, increased homelessness, increased income disparity. And these are issues that um, have become more, more exacerbated. Um, also issues with housing. Um, and so, <clears throat> and so th those are the main reasons why the university district has been selected. Well, I'm very happy that people are taking time aside, um, that they see that this is something important. Um, that they care about, and that that is very encouraging for me. I I wish that the technology um, issues we ran into were well. It's never fun running into you know problems with wires or when the internet isn't working. But aside from that, um, I feel very positive about it. I have a very we have a very strong team here. Um, everybody cares deeply and are hardworking. The next workshop, we will be viewing The House I Live In, which is a documentary looking at mass incarceration um, and how that is connected with the war on drugs and how that is one of the prominent manifestations of institutional racism. And incarceration is an issue that has been plaguing this country, the United States, in ways that um, exceeds any industrial country in this world. We are the leading country in incarceration. Um, since the 70s, our incarcerated population has increased by 700%, yet crime itself has been decreasing. And we're beginning to see um, who gets policed up in these systems and who gets caught in this cycle of oppression. Um, communities of color, women, um, trans and queer communities, immigrant communities, um, low-income communities. Um, it's just the research is very stark, and it's on, it's time that you know that we re revisit what democracy means and get people together to do something about it. Well, I, I I first think relationships are something that's always worth celebrating, 
and having gone through this journey with people at the end of this project, I think it's worth celebrating those newfound relationships, the potentials that they that might emerge for future future partnerships. Um, I also think that I'm very curious to see what issue the community advisory board is going to select and how we are going to act on it and how that might just be a small victory because small victories matter. It gives people hope and the more of those you have, well, the larger the change eventually can be.